Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Nicholas Tizak, uh, first time at SciPy. Um, I've been using Python since 2009 uh, when I wrote my master's thesis in physics uh, back in Germany, where I also grew up. Um, I'm a PhD student in applied physics at Stanford. Uh, I'll probably graduate next year. Um, and I really love Python, so I've been using a lot of the SciPy stack, uh, especially the packages I list here, which you probably all know except for the last one, which is pretty domain specific to doing simulations in quantum optics. Uh, and I wrote my own package uh, that's used in our community, which is pretty tiny, um, but the package is pretty significant <laughs> in size. So it's called QNet, and you'll see a little bit of it later on. Uh, this is where I work, um, my lab. Um, this is my boss, Hideo. And the guys I've circled here are all uh, pretty heavy Python users. And some of them uh, I take credit for having turned on to Python, uh, the ones that are underlined. Um, my own research is on photonic circuit models. And uh, I'm a theorist or computational scientist, as probably a lot of you. And um, so I work on the left side of this, but we do collaborate with Hewlett Packard on actually building devices um, because people in the industry, um, in, the, in the semiconductor industry, are really interested in finding ways to uh, get around looming uh, power inefficiency problems of, of computer chips. So we, because of this, we work on photonic circuit models uh, in the ultra low power regime um, and if we can someday build really cool devices, they will actually be in the quantum regime, but that's still kind of a far, far goal. Um, my actual work then consists of creating and analyzing physically realistic uh, circuit models. And uh, that involves different parts uh, in the workflow. So on one hand, you're trying to put together a circuit like here, so that's kind of design engineering work then you compute some kind of model from that that is analytic, and so that's a lot of math. And then finally, you try to simplify it and simulate it to see if the, if the expected result meets uh, what you thought. So that's very typical, I think, in a lot of disciplines, but just to like, kind of give you an idea. And then, obviously, um, a lot of this involves a lot of coding, so that's another big part of uh, the time that I spend. Um, my lab actually is both experimental and theoretical. So um, about half of the students work on tabletop optics experiments. And here you can see a project uh, that I did the theory for, uh, illuminated very nicely. And uh, I overlaid it with a circuit schematic because that's also the topic of today's talk. Um, we're trying to establish kind of a, a circuit theory for quantum optical systems and we're trying to build intuition for how to engineer things, how to put things together to make something useful. And um, in fact, for this setup, I actually contributed some real hardware, uh, an actual real world circuit. Um, okay, so the talk will roughly con c contain all this. First, uh, what do I mean by circuits? What defines a circuit? What's a circuit in the most abstract sense? Then um, the little widget that I programmed for this conference and that I'm going to use in my work soon, um, an IPython notebook schematic capture widget. Um, then how anybody else working with circuits and circuit models could integrate this widget in their own work. Uh, then finally I'll show some examples of that and uh, also um, specifically some of my own work. Just like a little hint, I won't have a lot of time. Yeah, and then I'll finish with some outlook and summary. So when I talk about circuits, probably most people start thinking about electronic circuits. So here's an example of a really messy analog plugged together circuit, and then this hyper-optimized integrated uh, circuit that's some chip. Um, obviously, there's a huge gap between these two, but at the same time, the engineering um, uh, discipline was built starting somewhere up here and then there, there have been layers of abstraction added and added to finally be able to do something like this. Um, and this abstraction for describing circuits actually applies to a variety of fields now. So I already showed you back here 
that uh, this is a, a circuit that doesn't work with electronics, but this is actually a waveguide. Uh, so it's like a ridge on top of a silicon substrate that traps light locally, and so the light takes the, uh, the function of an electrical signal. So it's, I mean, elect electronics and light are kind of the same thing, but obviously one is at a very different uh, carrier frequency. Um, so another example of uh, engineered circuits are microfluidic circuits, which are, which are pretty cool. Um, but that's just to kind of like show other engineering examples. Then there are also naturally occurring circuits. Uh, everybody has seen pictures of neurons in the brain. And there are more abstract circuits that people draw to describe gene interactions, which um, you could argue whether they're real, really circuits, but the fact is that people draw these diagrams and they use them to understand uh, what certain processes uh, involve and also to target probably how to like affect certain parts of the metabolism in a, in a very specific way. So I, I want to claim that circuits are very useful. Um, none of us could be programmers without this being a really mature field. Um, and they're useful for, for three or two and a half reasons. Uh, one as a really strong design abstraction to synthesize things for engineering. And then two, as a tool for understanding complex and interact interacting systems, such as the example back here. So if I try to describe what's going on here in a text, uh, I think I'd have to repeat that text quite a lot before anybody would have an idea of what's really going on. But if I gave you this, this uh, circuit diagram, you could kind of like start at one point and, and try to figure out what's going on. And you could use your visual intuition to, um, yeah, to figure this thing out. And then finally, well, that actually also touches on this, uh, they're really useful for visualization and communication. So what then did I come up with as a general definition of a circuit? Well, you have a bunch of individual circuit elements um, that have maybe some localized state space. Uh, and they are instances usually of some particular component type. And then each element uh, has some number of individually addressable ports. And then two or more of these ports can be connected with each other through a directed or undirected link. And then finally, the types of links in a circuit may not all be similar. So you might have a circuit in which uh, both electric uh, interactions take place as well as thermal interactions. Or as in the case of the brain, you even have some kind of chemical signaling going on. Um, then finally, like each, so this is more of an engineering thing. If you, if, you, uh, if you create some kind of data type representation of this, it's useful to also allow each component of a particular type to vary a little bit. So let's say you have a, a unique type for electrical uh, resistor, but the value of the resistance uh, can be configured. So there's a bunch of existing tools for circuits because obviously it's a huge industry. There's a lot of money involved. Um, so for integrated electronics and normal electronics, there's, there's SPICE, VHDL, Verilog. And then this uh, tool suite that is open source that I've used in the past, act the past actually for, for describing our kinds of systems um, called GDAGAF. Then both MATLAB and Mathematica have some tools to describe circuits or at least control systems. Um, and then there is a really big uh, uh, system now that, that is very universal and very beautiful called Modelica, um, which unfortunately doesn't work for the kind of circuits that I work with, but I think for a very large class of uh, other systems. So all kinds of electrical, thermal, torque, force, so mechanical systems can be described with this. And then there's a ton of smaller domain-specific tools, uh, a lot of them in, in Python. And I'll actually show one of them later because I, I uh, hooked up my code with it. So um, then the motivation for writing this little, this little widget, well, one was I wanted to come here. Um, but the other um, reasons are that uh, in my research, uh, I find that I'm spending more and more time in the IPython notebook. And um, at some point, it would be nice to not need any other tools anymore so that I can collect everything about my project in one file. 
So I've, I've kind of had this dream of a really cool lab notebook that could just be one file, right? And um, so the, the key thing for me was having the ability to visually edit circuits and not just to simplify maybe creating the circuit but also to have a visual representation that I can include later in some um, notes or paper or whatever. And so the, the, the notebook has some key strengths and that is that you have an instantaneous feedback of a small change. So that's similar to the org mode um, uh, app, like the workflow that we just saw, you can rerun a small part of code, get instantaneous feedback of what happened. And I think that's really important um, to stay focused and to not get bored. But if you, if you have to wait for a simulation to run for 10 minutes, um, it seriously impairs your workflow. So it's a lot of fun to be working on something that you get instantaneous feedback from. Um, and then the notebook also allows you to integrate code and visualizations which is really important, I think, because uh, communication just happens a lot better with visualizations. So the circ package then is just supposed, uh, look, I, I just wanted the circ package to extend these principles to editing circuits, which was uh, very specific to my own work, but I think, or I hope that other people could use this as well. All right, so here's a, a little demo. You can access the code online already. Um, it's still a little rough. But it works. Right, so uh, it, it uses a lot of JavaScript too, so when you import it, you also have to initialize the JavaScript. But so far, it's not necessary to put anything into your custom JS file or anything like that. This, this is enough to get everything up and running. Um, so as I mentioned before, you have to specify the physical domain of your circuit. So here I take an example that is uh, closer to my own work, which is with uh, propagating light fields between some kind of optical component. Um, but I also add, just for good measure, uh, some kind of electrical control mechanism on your circuit. So I have two different types of connections, one for uh, elect like light fields and one for electrical signals. Um, so I instantiate those. Then uh, I declare some ports that I reuse for all the components later on. Um, then I define the component types, and the types involve both some kind of name of the type and a specification of what ports. And in the future, they will also involve a specification of what parameters your component has and like how to, what default values or what, uh, what kind of numbers they can take on. Um, Right, and then I create a circuit. So what you see here now is um, I created some instances of these component types, um, and then I create a circuit here, and I already defined some connections and code down here. So it's pretty straightforward. I think the syntax, once you try to like read it, it kind of explains itself. You're just specifying tuples, like pairs of ports that are connected with each other. And this thing now is interactive. So um, you can drag things around, uh, you can uh, select connections, select ports, you can delete connections, and you can create new connections. <laughs> and um, depending on what type of domain, physical domain this is, you could maybe connect one or more ports with each other. Uh, so some, usually for this, for this uh, physical domain that I work with, you can only connect one output to one input port. Um, but the electrical domain allows more than one connection per port. Um, so this is all nice, but this doesn't yet allow to add components or remove some of the global interface ports. So I, I should have said these ports up here are the ports that lead into your circuit and out of your circuit. So that's once, you, once you've created this model, you might want to embed this into something bigger. Um, and so this is then how your circuit speaks to the outside world. Okay, and then finally, because I'm using D3, I'm also able to do like this cool like zooming and, um, and panning, which can get annoying when you're scrolling through the notebook, but it looks pretty cool. Um, okay, so to extend this with a couple more useful controls, I just wrap this widget in a larger widget by using the really nice widget composition uh, system that the IPython guys have built. And um, so here's uh, the example of that. So this is now, this pops up, gets around the problem that when you're scrolling and you're moving outside of the widget area, you're suddenly scrolling your whole document. 
Um, and uh, this allows you now to actually modify things. So you can rename components, um, and that then gets instantaneously updated. You can uh, add ports. So let's say, so of type field mode, direction out. So for causal directions, uh, ca causal connections, which do have a, a direction associated with them, you can specify for each port what directionality it has, and then you can add that. Or so now I have this port. Maybe I want to move this somewhere up and down in the in the order of ports. Uh, I can also delete it again. I can delete a whole component. Then all connections, of course, get removed that were hooked up to it, um, and I could add it back and so forth. Uh, one nice thing is, if you dock this, you can see that um, actually these two widgets are talking to each other because they uh, contain a representation of the same object. So um, this is a nice feature of using these JavaScript backbone models that the IPython guys have selected, and I think that's a pretty cool choice. Um, and then finally, uh, instead of already specifying everything up front as I did here with the connections and the components, you could just start from an empty, empty circuit and um, start building it from here. So add a new port, um, and so forth, and add components. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the circuit builder. Um, oh yeah, one last thing, I can also export SVG, um, which is nice. So if I click on this, this is an SVG file that you could uh, edit with Illustrator or whatever you use, uh, Inkscape. All right, so back to the presentation. Um, how can you... Uh, make this work with your own code, well first you have to tell this applet about what kind of uh, physical domains you're working with and what sort of components you have, how many ports they have, whether those are directed or, or undirected ports. Um, then you create your circuit just using the widget because all it needs to know is that. And then you read out the circuit and map that back to your physical domain model. So I'm assuming people that want to use this already have some sort of circuit simulation code that they can hook up to this. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, from there you proceed as you used to before, except now you created the circuit graphically. And, um, yeah, and then you, you iterate this process because it's about providing a nice tool for this design process that speeds up certain steps. So this way, I hope, step two um, takes less time than you used to take to create something. And especially it takes less time to get that thing that you created back into Python to interact with it. You could even um, programmatically interact with the circuit object. So you could add connections at random or something if you want to do large scale circuits like, I don't know, some neural model or something. Okay, so now some examples of domain specific workflows. I found a really nice um, uh, circuit simulation package online last night uh, called ACAB, and I guess it's close to SPICE. Um, I never actually used SPICE, except I think once in some lab class, so um, I can't verify that it's very, very similar, but it is very nice. So on the example page, you already see they, they have some Butterworth filter that they show the transfer function of, and um, so I'm, I'm going to do a, a less complicated circuit, but I will show how to integrate things. So here I import it. Um, I'm actually not going to restart this notebook because I already drew this nice circuit. I don't want to redraw it. Um, but here I, I, I did a very simple low pass filter. So anybody who's had an electronics lab knows it's like a, uh, a parallel circuit of, a, of a, um, a capacitor and a resistor. Okay. Um, and uh, the transfer function then shows that for high frequencies, the, the, the gain falls off to something very small. So that's as expected for a low pass. So now I define the types of components for the widget. So I just allow a voltage source, a resistor, a capacitor. Then I build it graphically using this applet that I showed before. And um, oh yeah, one thing I hadn't shown before, um, if you're bothered by the way the, the symbols are, are visualized, or the, the components, you can actually change this. Here's a, a little example um, where you can just specify SVG to turn this into a more typical resistance symbol. 
Um, but that's not very developed yet as a feature, so I'm still going to work on that. So this is where I'm changing it back. Um, so this code here in this cell is all it takes to translate um, all of these circuit models that contain only resistors, voltage sources, and capacitors back to something that this ACAP package understands. So it's pretty simple. Um, actually, some of this code generalizes, um, so I'm going to put it back into the package, and then it should be even shorter. Um, right, and then you can recompute the transfer function. And now here, because I wanted to um, uh, have like a way to also tweak the parameters, I embedded it into one of these interact uh, statements, so I can now like play with this, and um, yeah, it works pretty well. All right, so that's, that's that example. And now, briefly, a different type of example from my own work. Um, so I developed this QNET package. If you're working on, on um, generally anything quantum-y with open quantum systems, this might be interesting for you, <clears throat> uh, but otherwise, probably not. And um, so here, again, you have some kind of circuit definition, um, you have circuit components, which in our case are something like beam splitters, optical resonators with nonlinear medium inside, and so forth. And um, I created this circuit here, uh, again, just translating what kind of components are allowed. And then um, this is the whole function that's necessary to convert that back to an object for QNET. And then QNET is a, is a symbolic package, so you, you can gen then analyze the circuit. You can verify that the circuit that was created actually maps back to what you wanted. Um, and you can start doing all kinds of symbolic analysis on it. So this, by the way, uses SymPy very heavily, um, in addition to some custom algebra codes. Yeah, so that's, that's about it for um, the demos. Um, so in summary, uh, it's a new widget that's at this point, very lightweight, under 2,000 lines of code of both JavaScript and, and Python. Um, can very easily be integrated with existing packages, I think. Um, can also be used to export res representations, um, SVG files. Um, could probably be used in education and learning quite easily. And I think could also serve as a good example to other people developing more involved graphical widgets uh, that aren't just buttons and pull downs. Uh, yeah, so from here I'll probably improve the support for parameter man man manipulation and customization. Um, maybe provide some in interface with some of these packages. Definitely the last one because that's useful to my own work. Maybe the other ones. Um, and it, making it more easy to uh, customize the visual representation of symbols. <clears throat> and then a nice thing would be to have like an up hierarchy, down hier hierarchy button where you can uh, go like zoom into a schematic and look at the way some components are built up. Uh, yeah, so acknowledgments. Uh, thanks to everybody at SciPy and uh, everybody from the community in general. Then my boss for funding the trip and also being pretty supportive of software development in my lab. Um, my lab mates, especially Ryan, who works uh, with me on a lot of this and also writes a lot of code. Um, some fellowships. And uh, a quick plug, sorry to take up time, but one of my lab mates has wrote a really, uh, written a really nice instrumental package. So if you're doing any kind of um, uh, analysis that you want to automate with uh, scopes and, and some Thor Labs uh, power meters, so probably best for optics people, this, I think, is a pretty nice package. He's also very uh, meticulous about documentation, so I think it should be nice. Thanks. <laughs>